Um, yeah, good afternoon. My name's uh, Tanvir Saini. I'm from the East Midlands Sibsi Committee. Um, yeah, so thank you for joining us for, for the first of two CPDs on Above Ground Drainage um, in partnership with, with, our, with our speaker, Adam James from, from Jeverit. Uh, this first session uh, called Designing Drainage Without Compromise will introduce the topic and then we'll the topic of drainage in general and you know the, the main aspects of drainage design um, and then the session next week will will add some further technical detail the, the session hydraulics and drainage applications so we really hope you can join us for that one next week as well to, to complement this one um, so i'll hand over to adam now he's going to take us through this epd session um, if there are any questions during the session um, i think it's best please pop them in the chat and then We'll, we'll run through them at the end. I, th I think Adam's presentation produced us about 45, 50 minutes or so. Yeah, it should, um, should be somewhere around about that. Yeah. Perfect. So that'll give us um, plenty of time for questions at the end. So, yep, I'll hand over to Adam now. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for your time this afternoon. Um, CPD, as uh, Sam said, is uh, drain, designing drainage without compromise, looking at BSEM 12056 and unpacking a little bit of detail around it, around the requirements, uh, and also looking at some of the, the changes in more recent drainage and how, uh, how those developments come about and how they complement. So over the course of the presentation, first we'll have an introduction to Gebret, who we are, what we do, um, why we design with drainage in mind, um, the history of UK drainage, what's, what's happened over time, soil and waste system types, um, limited limitations of primary vented stacks and how they work, and then looking a little bit into um, low litre flushing and its effect on the UK drainage as we move more and more towards um, restrictions on volume of water required or reductions in volume of water required. And then summary, I'll pick up any questions. So if you've got any, um, do feel free to pop them in the chat. If they are individual sort of project um, or project related, by all means, um, drop me an email on adam.james at geberit.com or put them in the group and I'll either answer them at the end or we can pick them up in an email afterwards. So, who are Geberit? What do we do? Well, I've got a short video here to show you a little bit of information about Geberit, what we do. We are a three billion euro um, Swiss business leaders in drainage design and detailing for it for about 150 years. So really we are very much a, uh, a drainage expert business. So what I'll do is play this video and I'll show you some of the areas of the market we touch on.
that video we're a sanitary technology business um, and we invest in 10 key uh, technology areas about two and a half percent of the global revenue is put back in as um, research and development to help develop and continue to grow the business in terms of business you'll be used to us across most of those markets there in, in those sort of standard markets um, and we have three main areas. We have the piping system, we then have the sanitary systems behind the wall, and then we have the sanitary ceramics in front of the wall. Um, and in those sort of three key areas, it's about a 30% roughly, apart from sanitary systems being slightly larger, that being the frames and systems, but everything else is more or less a sort of a 30% split within the business of the piping, which is drainage and supply. And this is the area that we're going to be talking about today, that the piping systems over here for mainly building drainage systems. Still a European business based out of Switzerland. Most of our fabrication is still done uh, through Europe with little bits done further, further afield. Um, and we have three specialized production mark, uh, fabrication units very, very close to our market within Europe. So product is always available very quickly. And from our point of view of what we what we do as a business, as a European market leader in sanitary technology, we obviously have a very powerful brand, brand with a global presence and great technology, which leads us to um, a good delivered product for yourselves within the market. So that's a bit of information about who Gebret are and what we do. So why design with drainage in mind? What's the, what's the, the objective? So fresh water comes from the pipe and dirty water disappears down the drain. And putting it simply, that's just the way it is. It's the way it's always been. So nobody really considers drainage design until it becomes a problem. Once it becomes a problem, it's typically because of a block drain, um, typically because of something like foul air coming back. Um, you know, nauseous gases within buildings because the, the ventilation hasn't been allowed to happen properly. Or in fact, 
inaccessible pipe work that means there's a lot of work to be done to access that pipe in order to be able to clear it through. And those tend to be the, the reasons as to why drainage becomes a problem. In the UK, looking at uh, where we've been and, and what's happened. So originally cast iron was used really since the 17th century, a uh, very standard method of, of drainage. In the 1960s, UPBC was introduced more and more. Um, UPBC being a lot more lightweight um, than cast iron. So from an installation point of view was, was quicker. And then HDP was launched in the 1980s. And, and HDP really is, a, I suppose, a combination between cast iron and UPBC. It gives the, the performance characteristics from cast iron, but having the weight benefit of UPVC. So it's a more lightweight uh, product that is, is very similar to cast iron in its performance. And more recently, the acoustically optimised drainage pipe systems, um, where we actually have chevrons and acoustic performance available from the pipe in order that it will work better in application acoustically. And then typical jointing techniques. The, the main two that we really use in HDPE are butt weld and electrofusion weld with um, an electro welded sleeve coupling. We'll pick up a little bit more later on those, but those are really the, the most standard um, two products, uh, sorry, two, two welds around the product. Because of the way they weld together, because of the way they work together under a heat weld, they're very, very easy to cut, easy to handle, easy to manipulate on site. And they also create a very strong and reliable joint. One of the things with HDP is when it's uh, melted, when it's fused back together, the new formation of the, the structure in the HDPE is as strong as the original structure of the HDPE. So when it cools down, the molecular structure of it is such that it is the same as the original pipe. So the, the joint is as strong as the pipe, can be put through a vise and compressed, and it will still remain with the same integrity to the pipe. And HDP by its nature, as I say, very flexible, very resistant to cold and heat. Um, so there's, there's no particular problems with that. It can go up to 100 degrees um, over the life cycle of the product for short period of times for infrequent times, but typical operating temperature is 80 degrees. Chemically resistant as a product, and we have a complete chemical compatibility table that we can give to, to demonstrate which products it's compatible with. But ultimately, the lightweight nature of it means that it is simple to uh, retain to the building, to fix and to hold in place. So it's it's a, it's an easy product to process, an easy product to work with, giving you a very lightweight but reliable and dependable structure. In terms of the environment, uh, performance and the environmental benefits, when it comes to fabrication of the material, there is an awful lot of an awful lot less uh, water consumption, a lot less energy consumption. And as such, it's actually recommended by Greenpeace as an alternative to traditional drainage materials because of the fact that there's no chemicals used in the jointing. Uh, it can easily be recycled and easily be used as a scrap or the scrap can be easily recycled off waste, off site as waste. So it's a very, very good, simple system to work with and is highly recommended for its eco credentials. So looking more into soil and waste system types, I mean, looked at what HDP is and, and who Gebra are, what, what, are the, what are the regulations? So if we look at BSEM 12056, we're going to be looking at part two, which is the sanitary pipework layout and calculation details. Now in this presentation particularly, um, we'll be unpacking more about system three System one and system two, system one being the, the German Swiss Austrian practice, uh, system two being the Scandinavian and system three being the UK practice, um, and system four being the French practice. These are system one, two and three are the more prevalently used ones. System one, um, differently uh, to system three, allows a 50% fill, where in the UK we allow a 100% fill and they also allow um, appliances to be connected together in order that they then discharge into the main stack. 
The Scandinavian practice allows 70% fill, but also allows appliances to be connected together before they go into the stack. Whereas system three, which is the UK practice, has 100% fill and each branch discharge pipe is to be separately connected to a single discharge stack. Now we'll pick up on the reasoning for that later on and, and, and how that works. But typically in the UK, you, you will connect everything directly to the stack itself rather than jointing together. So there are five main design criteria when considering the, the pipe work you're looking at. This is under BSEM 12056, and that's going to be the size, uh, the air and water tightness of it, the gradient, access and acoustics from that, from that pipe and from that stack. So sizing wise, this is to ensure that the pipe is large enough to, to carry the, the waste that's going to be going through it. So typically in a wash hand basin, bidet, drinking fountain, you're looking at 40 mil. Going to either a sink, bath, shower, urinal, uh, you're up to 50 mil. And then when you have a combined waste, you go to 56 mil. Now, typically when you're combining, you would have two coming together and then immediately after it, you would have a larger pipe. So after the combination is where you'd have the larger pipe work, so that it immediately went into a larger pipe. And at that point, that's that's quite a standard detail. And then a 110 for a WC. 90 or an 80 mil with the outlet pan. Um, and we'll pick up on that 110 as to um, the restriction that offers in some areas, because houses need a 110 stack, but in reality, a 110 stack would actually pick up 50, 50 pounds. So there's an awful lot of work being done by, um, or can be done by a smaller pipe, which we'll pick up later on. So sizing of the stack, um, I'm sure you're all very used to this. Sizing a stack rather simply is taking whichever appliance it is, whichever system you're looking at, these are all in 12056, uh, table two, and these will give you system one, system two, system three. In this example, we'll look at system three, that's the, the standard um, UK. Um, you would then add up all the discharge units from the appliances to give you a total number. You then look at table three, so having looked at table two, you look at table three. Table three gives you the frequency, and this will give you the demand frequency on it. So um, offices are at 0.5, um, apartments will be 0.5, hospital schools will be slightly, lower, uh, slightly larger at 0.7. And then where we say um, congested use in toilets and showers, then so a football stadium or a rugby stadium or a theatre somewhere like this or a cinema, you would calculate to a value of one. Um, this is down to when they're in use, what is the frequency of that use? Um, so that's why somewhere like that, you would have a, a frequency of one typically. So basically the, the wastewater flow rate, which is the QWW, is the expected flow rate of the waste, um, which is calculated as the frequency factor. Um, so taking the square root of some of the discharge units multiplied by the frequency factor, and that, that gives us our requirement. So working through a quick example, um, you'll all have sort of looked at these sorts of things before. Uh, we then take that QWW figure and then put it into typically a swept entry or square entry. In the UK, it will always be a swept entry. And that will give us the size of the stack that we require in order for that discharge to go into. Now you've got table 11 and table 12. Table 11 gives it to you if you're using a primary vented stack. Table 12 will give you it if you're using a, a secondary vent in order to give you a, a, a slight um, increase in your litres per second flow rate. So if you were over 5.2 on a square entry, on swept entry at 100 mil, then you got to having a secondary vented pipe, which would give you 7.3 on a swept entry. So it just gives you an extra couple of litres per second. So quick example on that, if we were looking at a football stadium where you had 56 litre pans, so you would have 50 number at 1.7, which gives you 85. 100 number wash hand basins at 0.3 would give you 30. So your total discharge unit is 115. 
the square root of 115 is 10.7. Because we're looking at a stadium, we have a frequency factor of one because when they are in use, they're in high demand use. Um, so it's 10.7 times one, which gives us exactly 10.7. Um, we then put that in as a swept entry. It can't go into anything lower than a 150 because it's 10.7. So with a swept entry going into a stack, that would need 150 mil. In our case, we typically use 160 mil stack required for that system. So quite a sort of quick and, and simple way for for dimensioning what will be needed and how that stack will work. So that's sizing of the stack and what we do. Now looking at airtight and watertight, what's the requirements around this? So this is making sure that the foul air um, is, is leaving the building and leaks aren't occurring. So you'll see straight away uh, a wash basin and a sink both sit at 75 mil. Um, a shower and a bath sit slightly lower at 50 mil. This is the depth of the uh, the seal required in order to prevent the foul odour from coming back through the drainage system and up through the underside of the outlet in the bath or in the sink and becoming foul odour in the room. Uh, WC pan also sitting at 50 mil. Now, there are, in some instances, we're seeing more and more occasions where baths or showers are coming across from Europe, where they're coming across and they have a 38 mil on the underside because that's a requirement within um, mainland Europe. However, system three requires them to have 50 mil, so they do need to have a 50 mil depth underneath them. Airtight and watertight, something we touched on before, um, electrofusion welding basically means that the, the strength of the pipe and the integrity of the pipe remains completely um, sealed over the, over the longevity of, of the pipe working. So it means that we don't, we're not um, using any form of a solvent weld, anything like that. So these pipes, once they are heated together, pushed together and formed or under electrofusion collars, they are completely sealed homogeneously and they won't allow any leakage to come out through the path of them. Um, so we do recommend a homogeneous weld. Now these are commercial high rise and industrial applications. So these are sort of the sort of areas that we're working. Um, but yeah, we do recommend whenever you're using HDPE, um, either a butt weld or electrofusion weld. So, we looked before at how the product will work together, how we'll make, make sure it's airtight and watertight. There are other systems that we could use, um, but typically these are the main two details that we have, are either butt weld or EF welding. So going on to gradient, bear me on, it's gonna have a quick swig of tea. So, on the gradient, basically a fall is required to the pipe to make sure that we don't get a situation where either the pipe is sitting and stagnating and there is insufficient flow to the pipe, so the waste is sitting within the pipe, or alternatively we get such a gradient that the water runs away and leaves the waste behind. So as such, the, gra the gradient needs to be between one and five degrees. Uh, with a maximum distance from the appliance stack of three meters. Uh, we'll pick these pick these up in a minute. So the, the soil system needs to be between one and five degrees. Normally it's based at about two and a half degrees. And that will give us a drop of between 18 and 88 millimeters per meter to make sure that the pipe work is going to drain correctly and allow the waste out of the system. Access is a, a big area that needs a lot of consideration in the design to make sure that there is a rotting eye in the situation and it will actually allow the, the drain to be cleared should it back up. In some instances, we see uh, rotting eyes being put behind walls, which is fine. It, they can be designed in, in such a way that they have destructive access to get to them, but they must be above the flood point for the room so that they can be taken off and they can be rotted, cleared through, um, and they can then be reinserted. The cap on the front is a simple unscrewable cap that just gets replaced back afterwards. 
and that will work for, for clearing of drains post flooding. Cool. And then the last one is acoustics. So looking at acoustics and, and where sound insulation is required. Now, sound is subjective. So this sound quite pleasant, quite quite a nice background sound, whereas this sort of noise is not so nice. And we've probably all stayed in hotels or been to buildings where that's the sort of noise transfer that's coming through the building when your neighbour, either in his room or in the room above you, uh, evacuates their uh, their pan first thing in the morning. And uh, it's coming down and you hear it going through the, through the pipe work through the room, which is not ideal. So noise can be an unwanted sound. Um, building regulations part E basically says that dwelling houses, flats and rooms for residential purpose should be constructed in such a way that they provide reasonable resistance to sound from other parts of the same building and from adjoining buildings. So there's a, it, it's ambiguous in some ways, but obviously there are requirements then around the performance you need to get to. So a couple of years ago, I always forget about that bit of noise. A couple of years back, we uh, did some, conducted a survey and got some feedback into the percentages of, uh, and, and a feedback from people as to what they thought about noise. Obviously, 90% of people don't like wastewater noise. I'm not sure who the 10% were, but 90% of people don't. 90% um, of people have been disturbed by the wastewater noise, so noise coming through a building. Typically, I would imagine hotels, um, apartments, anything like that. And 55% of people would pay a little more rent to reduce the noise. So if you had a, a better acoustically performing building, then it would be an attractive proposition to people. Quite a, quite a big thing, really, because a lot of things are looked at as being saving money, but actually acoustics is something that can add a significant amount of value. And so in terms of acoustic performance, these can be carried out, um, again, HDP type products um, that can be used in order to make sure that there is superior sound dampening. Um, and this is using a, a product now in our product range. We have a product which is called DB20 and the DB20 is a 20% higher barium sulfate. Uh, barium sulfate is ground up stone, so it's a thicker walled product and it has the chevrons on the outside and they basically act in order to prevent that breakout noise where the impact of wastewater traveling through them would hit into that corner. So it's in order to, to prevent that breakout noise becoming airborne noise and passing straight into the room. Um, so it's, it's a complete holistic design to the approach, uh, sorry, to the, to the building. So in order to achieve it, using an acoustic pipe by itself won't necessarily give you the completed design what you need to do is use the acoustic design for the bathroom so have separation for the pan from the wall and then have a separation from the system to the wall in order that your, your frame is isolated so that at no point you're getting that noise into the pipe before you're then dealing with it you're isolating everything at every point so you're minimizing the noise transfer going from anywhere i'll call it client side through the wall and into the drainage side. So it's about protecting it before it gets there and then dealing with the acoustics of the waterborne noise as it's traveling through. The acoustically designed HDP is, is, um, is a very, very good way of doing it. Operates on the same performance of having either butt welding or having electrofusion welding and then has full isolation from the building itself. So when you're looking at db20 by all means or when you're looking at an acoustic solution by all means do go as a shout we do also have a cpd on acoustics which this one is uh, just sort of gives you a bit of information but if you do want to know more about it again by all means get in touch with us 
So limitations on a on a primary venter stack. We've looked at the pipes and the sort of drainage systems we use and how we size it and what we do. But what are the limitations of the primary venter stack? First of all, you, we saw the initial numbers there. With a secondary vent system, we can get a larger litre per second flow rate through it. So the UK system allows us to fill pipes to 100% full. And um, we then have rules governing the length and diameter of the of the system. And um, and obviously with a with a primary vented stack you, you do end up with positive pressure systems um, which can over pressure within areas and we'll call it over pressure because positive pressure makes it sound like a good thing um, so basically we'll be talking about negative pressure and an over pressure um, as we go forward um, and this is a case of looking at it and seeing how the different systems will work within different designs. So table two of the building regulations shows a diameter and lengths that are required, that being maximum length in metres for um, pan outlets, for wash hand basins, and you'll see depending on the size, sorry, depending on the length of the run will then give you the size of the pipe required and the, the gradient in millimetres per fall in order to make sure that the, the system is discharging correctly. And that's listed in, as I say, in, in part H of the building reg. So a lot of information there given on how to work within a, an unvented system by a primary vented. Now, two big areas of, of pressure problems that can build up. In a self siphoning system where basically uh, a branch pipe fills up um, and then starts creating a negative pressure area here and what this will do because of the way it's running into the in down the pipe length is this will actually carry on evacuating the water out of here because it's siphoning the water through once that siphon break happens which is when that, that water coming around that corner then you'll break the siphon but at this point the water trap the water will be below the trap level so any noxious gases or anything unpleasant building up in that stack will then vent through this pipe and be venting back through this sink or this wash hand basin back into the room itself so self siphonage is quite a concern because that can lead to very unpleasant odors coming back in and the second really is uh, induced siphoning so you had a bath here and you, you filled this bath, uh, when you drain this bath, if they both went into the same stack. And if this wasn't uh, a different size pipe here, what you could end up with is the path by Venturi actually to start to drain the negative pressure in the basin here. So at this point, what you end up with is this, this drain, or this sink, wash hand basin, being drained by the pressure of the bath water coming through, sucking the air in, which is coming through as water initially. And so in those two situations, you, you could have a problem. There is a third problem here, which is cross flow. Now, cross flow would happen, uh, as we'll pick up on a minute, um, if there wasn't enough distance between these two pipes, at which point, when you evacuate the WC, what you could end up with is everything that's in the WC arriving across in this pipe because the flow of the water will go straight across. So we do have conditions requiring the the optimum setting out height as well. So the solution to siphoning traps, increase the size immediately after the trap, that, that will certainly um, prevent the problem. Ensure the length between the end appliance and the pipe is less than 1.7 metres when the slope is less than 1.25 degrees. Uh, use anti-vacuum traps, um, not something that, that we supply. Fit an air admittance valve. Um, air admittance valves, Great product have limitations really at five stories anything over five stories and air admittance valves start to um start to have a problem because they're not constant they're not dealing with positive and negative pressure fully vent the system a, a great method of doing it because then you have a secondary pipe running that allows full ventilation to the system or using a sovent fitting next week we'll pick up on what the sovent fitting is and how that works and, and how that can assist in these sorts of designs so I mentioned there about the AAV. So head of the drain should always be out to atmosphere. 
And um, I mentioned there that not suitable for over store over five stories. Some will claim um, up to ten stories, but they only deal with negative pressure, so they're not dealing with overpressure in systems. Um, and the other the other issue with them is they need a, a good maintenance package and good maintenance program with them, because ultimately, if they get damaged, if they get dirty, if they get any um, any dirt into them at all, then they'll stop working very quickly. So that's uh, AAVs. So at the bottom of the stack, um, a positive pressure, as you can see, is created when the soil of a waste system hits an offset um, at the bottom of the stack because it's it's hitting with an impact and looking to turn. Um, so the um, positive pressure um, can start to have uh, an issue at this point and block the passage of air coming through this corner. Now, if this happens, then that passage of air with that that blockage there, stopping that passage of air is going to mean that when anything is coming into this stack, it's forcing air back up this pipe. As it's forcing air back up this pipe, whatever in this trap here is naturally going to start to pop back out, whether that be a wash hand basin or whether that be a pan, whatever is in there, is going to start gargling away and, and bouncing out at quite a velocity. Uh, you wouldn't like to be sitting on the soil, let's put it that way at that time, um, but it will start to, to bubble up and push any air through. So there's requirements around um, minimum connection distances. So at the bottom of the stack, we can only use a, a long radius bend or preferred method is using two offsets at 45 degrees with twice this, this distance here between the two bends being twice the diameter of the pipe. So it makes into quite a long system, but it does stop having that system where it is gargling the water and pushing water back through. Minimum connection zones from the corner system will apply in both, and that is up to three stories, 450 mil minimum connection zone, up to five stories, 740 mil, and above five stories is one complete floor. So these are, according to, these are the guidance from BS12056. Um, as I say, if you tune in next week, we'll, we'll look at a bit more sort of difference around that. And I'm just going to show you a video highlighting the positive pressure effects. This will show you kind of how So in the first half of the video, you saw a system where the pan was connected straight into the stack uh, at the bottom of it, and you could see the, the pressure when the upstairs toilets are flushing, forcing or blowing the trap. And then the second, you could see where it was going in through a stub stack into the soil stack, but it was vented through into the main stack. So it was allowing that pressure to be able to be relieved, and it wasn't causing that effect within the pipe because it had a pressure release system to it. So that's typically where secondary ventilation comes in. Very useful uh, on the ground floor, obviously, where you need to have it for a sub stack. But that just demonstrates the, the effect of secondary ventilation. So prevention of cross flow, mentioned this before, to make sure that whatever's coming from the pan isn't ending up straight across in the other person's bath. And this is set out to give a no connection zone within the pipe work to make sure that you must have centres of the pipe equally spaced apart. Guidance for this is given in building regulations um, and we'll give you the size of the stack diameter and then the no connection zone within it to make sure that you don't have two pipes coming opposite each other. So moving on from from that detail, looking at something really that's becoming more and more prevalent in the UK. The low volume flushing, its effect on UK drainage. 
So water consumption within the UK in terms of litres per second has typically been quite high, you know, 12 litres per second um, to actually flush the waste away, coming down through a pipe, going to the back of a pan in a very, very old system. Um, through to a, a wall hung system where we were looking at about nine litres a second. Um, through concealed systems, uh, dual flush systems, obviously reducing it. So you had a, a four and six. And then moving down to 2008, where you had a four and a half litre flush. And obviously moving on where we're constantly looking at reducing the amount of fresh, clean water that is being used purely to, to evacuate waste from a from a pan and we are moving towards lower literature it is something that is um, a much more environmental uh, desire from a point of view of, of, of use of that water um, building regulations part h only makes reference to um, flush volumes of five liters or more and essentially in bsem 12056 um, it doesn't actually make anything, it doesn't make any provisions for anything uh, less than seven and a half litres, sorry, five or six litres a second um, in system three. The only one that will allow a lower flush rate is system two, which goes down to a four litre flush. But as it stands uh, within system three, we don't have an, an allowance for anything less. Interestingly, though, something there is um, part H does state that the consideration to increase risk of blockages should be given where the major flush is less than five litres. So as we're moving down to a four, four, four and a half litre flush, and that's, just, that's quite a concern. So looking at the fill ratio of pipes, realistically below 50% you have insufficient flow. You don't have enough um, flow of water to evacuate the waste. When you go above that and you start getting to 0.8, then you end up with very little air in it. So you're looking at a 0.8 fill. So at that point, you're working more siphonically. You don't really want your drainage going siphonically. It's, if you're doing it with rainwater, it's great. If you're doing it with drainage, it's, it's not gonna go well. Um, whereas you want about between 50% full and 0.8% full, that will give you sufficient flow on a good gradient to evacuate both the foul water and the waste from the pipe. So if we look at a 110 mil pipe versus a 90 mil pipe with a four and a half litre pipe, with a four and a half litre flush, you'll see that with a 100 mil pipe, with a four and a half litre flush, you're about 30% fill. So that's quite low. Um, and you can imagine once this water is evacuated, if the waste has any weight to it, it is not going to go very far. Whereas with a 90 mil pipe, you're looking at about a 50% fill ratio, much better, much better buoyancy to the water and so much better um, journey for the waste and for the water and an increased chance of everything being evacuated. On a regular slope, one and a half to two and a half percent with a good fill ratio, we will allow the waste and the wastewater to be evacuated through the system at a, at a good velocity. With insufficient, hope, uh, insufficient slope, typically the wastewater will, will run, but the waste may stay. Equally, if there's an excessive slope, the wastewater is really going to run off and the waste is going to stay behind. So there's a lot of considerations given as to not just the angle, but also the size of the pipe. So if we look at a four and a half litre flush rather than a six litre flush, um, we size the pipe at 90 mil instead of 110, then that would give us a massive benefit because first of all, we're gonna be using a smaller flush, so it's gonna be more economically safe, sorry, more environmentally safe. It's gonna be more economical because it's a smaller pipe. It's gonna be a more efficient building. Um, it will have benefits from a point of view of Briam, and it obviously it'd be benefits for local authorities because you're putting less water through the system. Um, in terms of making the adjustment to the system, that can be done manually. Um, and it will give us the correct amount of water with the correct amount of waste to allow that flush to happen. So we've moved from a 100 mil pipe at a 50% fill with six litres 
to a 90% a 90 mil pipe with a four and a half litres still giving us 50% fill. As such, it's going to mean that we're going to keep um, we're going to keep any waste water and waste solids flowing through that system. So I'm going to show you a very quick video on that, which demonstrates it. And this is uh, a race, if you like. Uh, it's a poo race. So it is a European sized poo. Um, didn't know such a thing existed, but it is a European sized poo going through a waste system. And you'll see the system is adjusted from six litres to four and a half. And it shows the difference occurring between a one, 100 mil and a 90 mil pipe and how that performance changes and what it does to the efficiency of the movement of the waste through the pipe. So you've got a 110 first and then a 90 mil second. So I'll play you this video now. <laughs> See there the, the difference between a 90 mil pipe and a 110 mil pipe and the performance it has on the evacuation and making sure that the the waste is adequately transported the full distance within the pipe. Um, so how does that affect it? Well obviously a 90 mil pipe is allowed within building regulations so long as it's gone through local authority and as long as they give approval um, if you're using a, a smaller flush on a system. So over the course of CPD, we've looked at uh, everything really with regards to the, the basics around drainage, how it works within 1 to 056, what we need to allow for and, and what we need to make sure will work within 1 to 056. Um, next week's CPD picks up on some of the extra areas there, but looking at how we can hydraulically optimise a tool building and make that work within 1 to 056, um, but also some of the, I would say, shortfalls of 1 to 056, where BS 1 to 056 is a 20 year old document and doesn't allow for high rise building. So, next week's presentation unpacks 1 to 056, but with more detail on, on how we can look at it in very high rise buildings. So, I will uh, go to the questions and yeah, there's a lot of questions, Adam, about um, the slides, um, if they can be issued um, for reference purposes. OK, yeah. I guess we can um, we can do that through um, in the delegates list. We'll probably arrange for a, a link to be sent around um, everyone who, who had signed up. Um, so yeah, that's no yeah. problems at all. We can we can issue yeah. the, the slides. It, it's also going to be um, 
this session's also going to be uploaded to YouTube as well, um, if you want to yeah. watch it back as well. So, yeah, what, what, look out in your inboxes um, for, for a link to, to the slides, and we'll organise that through Sibzi. Um, right, so that was the most common question, wasn't it? The, the slides, um, so we slide that yeah. one off. No worries. Um, there, there were a few technical ones in there as well. Um, so let's, let's, let's find some. So <laughs> a lot of questions about slides. Right. Oh, I think the first technical one actually was for myself. Actually, um, <laughs> so on the automatic air vent slides, there there was a, a bullet point that said um, nine to one ratio max. Um, could you elaborate what that ratio is? Because I might have missed it. That's the. Um, I think that nine to one ratio max references the sizing of it um i think that's under 12056 um and i think that is the the sizing of it what i'm going to do is i've got a colleague who can possibly answer that one off the top of his head uh, if i can find martin i will put martin on unmute because he's probably on mute at the minute uh, uh, da, 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 da. Are you there, Martin? You might not be there. Um, but yeah, that refers to um, the, the the sizing of the system. And I will send you through the bit that references that, and I'll send that out as an answer to everybody. Um, but I will pull up the nine to one ratio and where that's where that comes from in one two eight five six guidance. Okay. If that's okay with you. Yep, that's fine. Thank you. Um, all right, the next technical question um, it's from, from Nick. Um, do you have any products similar to this, the Studor Mini AAV for venting individual appliances? Yeah, so we have um, a full range of AAVs. We do different size AAVs. So we do a smaller size um, 90 mil, then we go up to 110 as well. Um, so, yeah, we do have a full range of AAVs. Um, all of them are on our website, and again, I can give you the the link to those. Um, um, but yes, we do have a range of AAVs that can be used, and I can send you those out, or you or they're on our website. Yeah, I think we'll probably send an email to all the delegates with the link to the slides and some some yeah some, uh, answers to some of these questions. Fantastic. Right, uh, the next one's from Steve. So he's asking about when you have a wet room with a floor gully, um, like a floor shower gully, uh, the waste has virtually no gradient in the screed. Is there a way to overcome the self siphonage issue that occurs with this? Is that something you've come across, Alan? Um, so, yeah, basically we, some of that will get unpacked next week. We have a product called a Sovent and the way the Sovent works is it collects everything together um, and brings it into the stack in one unit and so that removes um, that cell siphoning area because of the way it enters into the pipe so typically um, where it's multiple see that sort of thing we'll, we'll use the Sovent system um, the Sovent is I'll send you out the details on the Sovent I've got one here so it looks like that and it basically collects everything together from one floor so you can enter a, a shower into the lower outlets on it and a pan in the upper outlets on it um, and that will prevent um, the self siphoning um, it is it is quite difficult because it, a lot of buildings have very very shallow floors and as such it's very hard to get the gradient on them from a shower but um, it's about kind of managing the access then going into the into the main stack Okay, great. Thanks, Adam. Um, so Simon Vaughan's got a couple of questions as well. Uh, firstly, are there any valid reasons um, associated with the drainage system for avoiding waterless urinals? The first one. No, um, as far as I'm aware, um, there isn't anything that really references, but the, the issue you get with 12056 is 12056 is, is quite an old document. So was about before really the the inception of waterless urinals so it's 
it's a difficult one really because so long as they have so long as they're fitted with something like a, a non self siphoning trap at the bottom then it they will remain um functional but there's there's nothing in 12056 really that picks up on on uh, waterless urinals Um, next question from Simon. What, what are the maximum straight pipe run lengths to avoid expansion contraction issues with welded pipes? Is, is that covered next week at all? Because you talk about large buildings next week. Which um, means... we, it's, we recommend that every floor you put in an expansion socket. Um, you Basically, the expansion of HDPE is around about one centimetre per metre. So over a five meter pipe length, you could get up to five meet, five centimeters of expansion. So because of that, we recommend putting an expansion socket in every floor to enable the pipe to expand and contract accordingly. Um, this expansion socket will adequately take for five centimeters expansion and contraction within the pipe as well. The, the standard talk about how how um, frequently you should have them in a straight run at all. Is that which the um, the actual yeah, the, the, the EN for one two oh five six one two oh five six. It's um, it references to once I think BSEN one two oh five six refers to one every six meters. I think is their guidance. Um, we say every story because six meters is pretty much just over mm. it's somewhere in between. So if you put one in every story, then it's in the same. Yeah. You know, you have one every story. Um, but yeah, as long as it's less than six meters and that's actually picked up in building regs as well, I think as, as well as one to oh five six, I think that's in part H. Um, and that's the that's standard on all HDPE to allow for expansion and contraction within the pipe. Okay. And that's in the vertical pipe. Um, next question from Sasan. How does the reduced pipe size work with the connection to the WC pans? I'm guessing this is the 90, the 90 mil sort of. Um, yeah, the, the, how does what, sorry, the, how does. Uh, so if you've got a 90 mil, well, it's, mm -hmm. I think it's the recommendation of a 90 mil out um, mm -hmm. sort of discharge pipe, uh, but WC pans, I think by standard, they're sort of 100 or 110, aren't they? Um, so, quite a lot of them are 90 mil because of it being European sizing. So a lot of them are 90 mil, but once they go out from the pan, they go out to a larger size. In terms of working into a smaller size, it's it's not a problem working it with a smaller size at all. Um, the, the pipe work on the back of it will work the same with a, a 100 as it will with a 90. Um, it's just about controlling that size of the pipe to make sure that once it's being evacuated from the bowl, it's then able to, to, to carry as efficiently as possible. But I guess um, pipe adapters are available to go between yeah, the sizes. Yeah, pipe yep. adapters to go between the sizes and to make sure it's going to work. OK, cool. Uh, right, the next technical question. Um, so, Syed's asking, what is the maximum length we can run a pipe without any gradients if there's no access for the gradient because of site conditions? I guess it's probably not recommended to run it at all without the gradient, is it? Without a gradient, no. Without a gradient, you shouldn't be running it at all. Um, there is something that comes in next week, and next week we will be talking about running a flat horizontal offset, which can go up to six metres, and that's using the system that we'll talk about next week, which is called Sovent and SuperTube, and that will allow you a pipe to be run completely flat, horizontal, as an offset within a building, as I say, up to six metres. So if you want information before that, do feel free to, to drop me an email um, and we can talk about that project. Or if you're back next week, if it's um, if it's if it, if you want to wait until then, then we'll pick up on that next week. But typically, if you're running a, a, any other pipe, it will always need a gradient. Thanks. Right. Um, next question from, from Tim. Some that. Uh, the, the propeller WC uses only one and a half litres per second, litres per flush. Would you advise to steer clear of that? Have you come across those toilets before, one, Adam? One and a half litres per second. Um, um, that's, 
that's not an awful lot. Um, I, oh, I, would have to past, I would have to run that past our technical team. I, I wouldn't be able to answer what, what you'd need to do with that, but one and a half litre second, I'm assuming that's the half flush, and I'm assuming there would have to be a larger flush than that somewhere else. Um, but it's certainly one, if you want to email me about it, then I will happily run it through our technical team and see what they come back with. Um, so, yeah, absolutely no problems with that at all. Okay. Right, the next thing, North and Vicky. Um, I've used AAVs alongside POPA valves in the past for a nine storey building. What are your technical thoughts on this? As uh, you recommend nine, uh, five storeys max on AAVs. I, uh, yeah, um, basically anything really up to 10 stories, you could go with a primary vented stack. Um, nine stories, you could go with a primary vented stack and uh, depending on your uh, QWW, um, I would at that point either have a, um, a stub stack on the ground floor and then going to the rest of the building, taking the standard stack going through. Um, or alternately, I if you had any offsets or anything like that within the building, I'd looking at using the Gebret super tube system. Uh, the super tube with the so vent, nine stories is is about kind of the the ideal situation for that, and that will give you a that will keep you with a primary vented stack, but instead of having a, a pressure attenuator system to keep the pressure balance within it the system will self-regulate on its pressure by keeping the annular and the laminar flow within the pipe. So if I was looking at doing that, because of the, the limitations of an AAV at five stories, I would look at going through um, using the Sovent system in conjunction with the super tube if you had any offsets. If you didn't, I would just look at using the Sovent system. That's basically a a pressure attenuator, but it's a passive system rather than an active system. Okay. So it's it, as a passive system, it's it's less likely to get blocked or less likely to get um, silted or need replacement because it will just purely sit and operate all day long in the pipe as part of the pipe function. All right, okay, uh, next question, Robert Hedges. Are there any options rules available to join primary stack vents in order to reduce the overall number of vents and holes in the roof. So yeah, joining with stacks, like vent stacks, basically. There are. You can you can bring different um, you can bring different numbers of stacks together and ventilate them depending on the system you're using. You can bring um, one of our systems allows up to. I am going to say 13, it might be 14 stacks to come together and then allows one central discharge pipe or uh, yeah one central air stack pipe of about 350 mil at the top but that will allow multiple combining together so it's 110 for one and then up to three goes up to 160 and then it goes up to a two uh 220 and then up to a 250 and it will start to to make it a larger total at the top typically the problem you get is if you're trying to bring too many together is the actual void space that you have in the roof to run your service through and to try and bring everything together and tie it together in the structure but yeah you can bring multiple pipes together and then discharge again it's it's design on system so it's it's one if you want to email me about feel free to and we can come back to you with an exact answer on the system you're looking at great thanks uh, right, next question is on um, AAVs again uh, from Simon. It isn't unusual to see AAVs outside, aside from regs. Is there a technical problem with this setup? So things like freezing, I suppose, might be. Out, outside of a, a yeah. building? Yeah, basically yeah. A, AAVs are, um, by the by the product themselves, they're very sensitive because it's it's designed to move on air pressure within the pipe. Um, and it's only designed to go one way. So certainly having them outside is quite a risk from a point of view, as you say, freezing, um, debris getting in them, even atmospheric debris getting in them will block it and will, will cause problems with the movement of the of the material over time. So it will stop it working efficiently and effectively. So yeah, AAV certainly having them outside would be quite a concern. 
Right. Okay. Um, I guess you've never seen people try to trace eat them or anything like that, <laughs> or try and get away with it. <laughs> no, um, no, they. they it's, it no, it's the, you, you try, <laughs> yeah, you'd be trying to have a trace heat system going to <laughs> them outside the building as well. Yeah. Be, oh, um, God, no. Yeah. Wasn't a serious suggestion. Um, well, one from Niall now, Niall Bergen. Um, if a wash hand basin is further than three meters from the stack, what are the options? So, uh, I think if you go up to four meters, I think it says you can uh, you can go. Let's have a quick look. Um, I think it was up to four meters. Is it you can go to a 56 mil pipe? Uh, um, da -da -da. Yeah, four. Sorry, 50 mil. So if your uh, maximum uh, length of branch pipe is four meters, at which point you go to a 50 mil pipe? Right. Okay. So, so you can go up the to. Yeah, just make the pipe slightly bigger, and by by making the pipe diameter slightly larger, you'll you'll give it the run. That looks like though, if, if you're beyond four meters, it's by the letter of the regs, it's not possible. Yeah, by the letter of the regs, it's it's not possible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. Next question from Matthew. Um, Matthew Rogers, why are floor gullies, urinals, etc., flow rates not detailed for system three? Why are sorry floor gully urinals? Yeah, floor gullies and urinals. Um, so there's a, a few appliances where the flow rates are not detailed for system three. So system three. Uh, da, 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 da. Would that not be the slab urinal? I don't. I don't know. Is the answer. Um, but I would have thought that would be a slab urinal. Um, but I, I don't know that to be the case. Um, obviously, that's a single urinal. Um, and I think a slab urinal will be where you have multiple people using it. Yeah, like a trough. Yeah. Trough urinals. Um, I would guess, but it's um, I don't know why they're not detailed as individuals. Again, BS12056 is a is quite an old document, so it's not something that is it's for 20. I think it was written in 2000. So it's so if you had to choose a flow rate, if you had a system three and you did have individual urinals or, or floor gullies, would you tend to the high one of the higher numbers in the table to be safe? Yeah, I, I would. If you aren't sure the if you uh, and typically if we're not sure so if we're working so let's say we were doing a calculation on a six litre system if i was calculating i'd work on a 1.7 figure um without being told what it was if somebody were to tell me exactly what it was requiring then i could calculate it if they didn't i would work worst case scenario if you work worst case scenario then you know you're going to be okay um okay it's it's similar to if someone's using a washing machine okay most people are going to use a six kilogram washing machine if it goes up to commercial and it goes up to 1.2 then it's different but certainly with systems i would always work on the large number to make sure and the, and the numbers which are missing in the table you'd, you'd pick one of the larger ones the largest number for the other from the other systems possibly as a um well we you see the, the, the I spoke about the four liters per second. So the only one that actually puts it in is system two. Now, because of that, we can't actually put any number in. So sorry, 1.8. So we can't even use that 1.8. It's simply not permitted under 1 to 056 as a sizing. So in some of them, you could potentially work on a different number. Um, but certainly with these, um, we're, we're very limited. Equally, we don't allow for a floor gully in those positions either. Um, so a floor gully would be a floor gully uh, toilet system. So typical to so like a more European or uh, sort of uh, what you might call a squat toilet, that sort of thing, rather than a pan that you'd see in the UK, an older style mm -hmm. sort of European system. Okay. Oh, what's um so Joe's asked poly pipe didn't show a 56 mil pipe in that range it goes from 50 to 82 is, is 56 a European size uh yes and it's it, it's a normal size for us in HDPE um 
it's we do a 65 as well on the way up. Um, so yeah, we've got quite a few. We've got quite a range of sizes because of the fact we deal globally. We obviously have sizes for all different markets, so we've got a a broad spectrum of different pipe sizes, um, kind of anything from 40 mil up. So we have quite a large spectrum of them that are available. And the 56 is more of a European size, yeah. OK, looks like we've got one more technical question from, from Rob. Um, it's about AAVs. So if AAVs are, are, are boxed in internally, um, do they need, did you need to include like a vent in the boxing in or a grill? Um, I would say yes, um, because much as they're not going to be drawing a great, it's, it's not going to be a completely homogeneously sealed box, so they will be drawing some air through the, the framing for the box. But certainly I, I would be looking to do something. They'll need, you'll need to have access to it anyway um, in order to be able to service it and in order to be able to have a maintenance program so that you can check it's still working. Um, if it fails and, and you haven't got any other release in your system, then it, it could potentially cause a pressure related issue. So I would certainly make sure that the, that it was accessible, uh, manageable, maintainable, in which case, yeah, I think certainly having something you can gain access through would, would be a, a grill or something that you can get into it. So just because it, it only needs a small amount of air to work, just your normal leakage around access panels. Yeah, normal suffice. leakage. Around. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, we just had another question pop through. Uh, if discharging to a gully on the ground floor, um, if discharging to a gully on the ground floor, do the same maximum lengths also apply for WCs, um, basins, etc.? So I guess the length to the stack, maximum lengths, do they apply if you discharge into like um, an open gully? Um, yeah. Don't know. I've not come across those sorts of designs very much. Most things, most things are run in pipe. Um, I would have to look and come back to you as the answer on that. Um, I as as long as you have the, I suppose you wouldn't be still in the pipe, so you'd now be on a, on a, an open pipe. So if that pipe was a hundred, if that was like one hundred and ten mil, um, I wouldn't know. I would have to look and come back to you on that. Um, my gut sort of says you it might work but i i would have to look at it properly and come back to you and just get a feel from a feel from what our technical department think okay, no um okay, that's the last of the technical questions um i don't think i missed any um are there any more for any more um i mean we'll we'll package the the presentation up oh, um yeah. with some answers to, to some of the questions um as well and get that sent out to to everyone um, through the mailing list. Um, yeah, doesn't look like we have any more questions, which means you'll get a bit of your your lunch hour back. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, go and get a sandwich somewhere. Now that, that, that listen, thanks, thanks ever so much for your time. Uh, very much appreciated. If there is anything that you think of uh, after the event that you want to give me a shout, do do feel free. Give me a yell. Um, Obviously, if you're here next week, we'll we'll talk more in depth about um, the design using Sovent Super Tube, how you can make that work in a building. And um, yeah, look forward to seeing everybody then. Thank you for your time. Yes, thank you all. I'll put a link to the next week's in the chat as well, in case anyone um, needs, needs a link to it. But yeah, thank you all very much um, and hopefully see you next week. Brilliant. Thanks so much. Take care. Cheers. <laughs>